Hey everyone, welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Matt Bon Jovi, and I'm thrilled to be welcoming Richard Wolfson to our stage today. Richard is a professor of physics emeritus at Middlebury College, where he has also taught in the environmental studies program, as well as at the Middlebury Institute in Monterey. Richard did his undergraduate work in physics and philosophy at MIT and Swarthmore. He holds a master's in environmental studies from the University of Michigan and a PhD in physics from Dartmouth. As an author, Wolfson's work has focused on making science accessible to non-scientists. And he's here with us today to do just that as he discusses his book, Nuclear Choices for the 21st Century, A Citizen's Guide. It's an unbiased guide to nuclear technology and the controversies that surround it. His book covers everything from the basic physics needed to understand nuclear technologies to nuclear power plants, nuclear weapons, non-proliferation frameworks and treaties, and much more. It's remarkably extensive and genuinely accessible to readers, no matter what your background. Now, throughout Richard's talk today, you might have some great questions popping into your head. And when you do, please go ahead and add them to the YouTube chat on the right. We will have time shortly for Richard to answer some of these. So be sure to get your questions in early. But first, Rich, thank you so much for being here and please take it away. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking largely about nuclear energy, particularly from an environmentalist perspective. I won't be talking about nuclear weapons or nuclear medical technology. I'll be talking largely about nuclear energy. Um, just a word about my book. It is the uh, reincarnation of a book I first wrote 25 years ago with the MIT Press. My new version is with my colleague, Ferenc Dalmaki Vares from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies, Center for Non-Proliferation Studies. So we had a good time putting this together and the book was just published in March. I do wanna mention one other book that I'll be referring to heavily, which is my textbook, Energy, Environment and Climate, uh, which I'm in the process of writing the fourth edition. And so I'll have many new updates associated with that. So let's get started. Um, I'm not the only environmentalist with a perspective on nuclear power, and I just want to give you a few others. Um, James Lovelock, whom you've probably heard of, is the uh, founder of the Gaia hypothesis that Earth is kind of a unified system that keeps itself under, uh, under control by a number of feedback devices. He says uh, it, this has proved to be the safest of all energy sources. James Hansen, who's a, a retired climatologist for NASA, who was famous for being the first person to testify in Congress back in 1988 to warn us about global warming. Uh, he warns us of the danger of anti-nuclear environmentalists who could cause the development of advanced safe power to be slowed. Uh, Kristen Zaitz is one of the co-founders of a uh, remarkably named organization, Mothers for Nuclear, and she claims it's actually the safest way to make reliable electricity. Uh, Stuart Brand, who people of a certain age will remember as the author of the Whole Earth Catalog, says, with climate change, those who know the most are the most frightened. With nuclear power, those who mo know the most are the least frightened. Now, these are four environmentalists who believe strongly in nuclear power. I'm somewhere a little more nuanced, but I'm also uh, not in this extreme direction of Greenpeace, who says nuclear power is an unacceptable risk to the environment and humanity, we have to shut it all down. So those are some other perspectives, but I'm gonna give you my perspective. And I'm gonna look at four questions. First of all, is nuclear energy safe? Uh, what are its environmental impacts? And then I'm gonna focus on the really issue of the day, which is could nuclear solve our climate crisis and will it solve our climate crisis if it could? So I wanna begin with a look at what I call the nuclear difference, which contrasts nuclear reactions, the reactions that power our nuclear power plants and also our nuclear weapons and also the sun, uh, with chemical reactions, which are typically what we do when we burn fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, or we metabolize our food in our own bodies. So here's a typical chemical reaction, would be burning coal. Coal is mostly carbon. The black circle is a carbon atom. The two blue circles joined are an oxygen molecule, two oxygen atoms joined. And when coal burns, it joins carbon with oxygen to make carbon dioxide, uh, the greenhouse gas that we're worried about in the context of climate change. And it also makes 4.1 energy units. Um, never mind the units, well, I'll tell you what they are. They're electron volts, a physicist's favorite unit, but we don't need to worry about that. The point is it makes four of them roughly. And so I've indicated that by a rather small, uh, amount of energy over here on the right. 
A nuclear reaction, and the typical nuclear reaction we're interested in here is fissioning uranium, splitting uranium nuclei. What happens in this case is a neutron, that's what the N is, a small subatomic particle with no electric charge, comes in and hits an isotope of uranium, uranium-235, uh, the rare kind that is able to undergo this reaction. <clears throat> the uranium splits, it produces a bunch of radioactive stuff, it varies with individual reactions, and it produces three more neutrons, which go on to allow a nuclear chain reaction to occur. But for our purposes, the big deal is it also produces 200 million energy units. So I've shown you a great big energy here. There's 4.1 energy units from the chemical reaction and 200 million from the nuclear reaction. And I call that the nuclear difference. And it has many manifestations, which I wanna run through quickly. Um, nuclear reactions, uh, whatever kind they are, fission, nuclear fusion, radioactive decay, produce millions of times more energy than chemical reactions like burning fuels or metabolizing food. And I'm gonna look at some manifestations of that. Here's one. On the left, you see a coal burning power plant. This happens to be in Kansas. It's fueled each week by 14 110 car train loads of coal come in. So roughly two a day come in, coal is piled up into a big pile and the coal is burned in the power plant. On the right, you see refueling of the former Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant, now shut down in my home state of Vermont. Um, and uh, this plant was refueled with two truckloads of nuclear fuel every 18 months. That's the nuclear difference. We need 1,410 car trainloads a week to fuel the coal plant. We need a couple truckloads every 18 months to fuel the nuclear plant. There are other manifestations. Uh, a single nuclear weapon can destroy a city. Here's a photo of Hiroshima after the bombing. Nuclear radiation damages living cells because the high energy associated with nuclear reactions spews out particles at very high speeds and they can damage living cells. Uh, and the picture I'm showing you here is actually a useful uh, version of that, which is uh, nuclear radiation is being used to damage cancer cells in cancer treatment. So that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, the other aspect of the nuclear difference is we need far more fossil fuels than nuclear fuels. So we mine about 7 billion tons a year of coal. Here's a strip mining of coal, whereas uranium, we mine about 60,000 tons a year, much less. Uh, the nuclear difference also affects how much waste products we produce from these two kinds of, of power production. Fossil fuels are contributing about 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year into Earth's atmosphere. Nuclear waste, we produce about 10,000 tons every year, 10,000 tons versus 40 billion tons of HLW. HLW stands for high level nuclear waste. It's dangerous stuff, but look how much less of it there is than the stuff we're dumping into the atmosphere as if it were an open sewer with our fossil fuel burning. The picture on the right, by the way, shows some uh, so-called dry casks, which is how we're now storing the nuclear waste at uh, power plants. And I'm not gonna say much about nuclear waste, but if you have questions about it, I'm prepared to answer them. Uh, now, is nuclear energy safe? Well, of course it's not. No energy source is perfectly safe. And here's a compilation from a number of studies uh, of the death rate per terawatt hour. A terawatt hour is a unit of electrical energy produced. So just think of the left-hand side as a measure of how many deaths there are per energy produced from different uh, power plants. And remember, there are many more coal and particularly gas power plants than there are nuclear or wind or hydro or solar. So these are per energy produced. Uh, there are actually more deaths from fossil fuels uh, absolutely than this picture would indicate. But look at the situation. Coal produces something like 25 deaths uh, per terawatt hour of electricity. Oil is down a little bit. Biomass is down about uh, to under five. Natural gas is about two to three. Nuclear is next at 0.07. I can't even see the bar on this graph. Wind at 0.04 from uh, accidents associated with people servicing wind turbines. Hydroelectricity uh, from a number of uh, possibilities, including dam breaks and solar, uh, largely from people falling off roofs uh, when they're servicing solar systems or installing them. But the death rate from these different energy sources is very, very different. And by any objective measure, nuclear is one of the safer, though it's not by any means the safest. So no energy source is perfectly safe. So there's always an answer that nuclear energy is dangerous. But to make that statement, you have to compare it with other energy sources. Um, is it safe? And when we compare it with fossil fuels, there's a new study just published uh, this winter in the journal Environmental Research by uh, scientists from Harvard and three British universities. And they conclude that uh, particulate pollution only, 
that's just one aspect of the pollution produced by fossil fuel combustion, is responsible for 9 million premature deaths annually. In China, it's 2.4 million. In India, it's 2.5 million. In Europe, it's 1.5 million. In North America, it's 500,000. And I simply took that uh, estimate from the previous graph of nuclear deaths per generation of energy, and I scaled it to ask what would happen if all the fossil energy were replaced with nuclear, and the answer would be about 25,000 premature deaths annually worldwide. Now, that is a lot of deaths, um, but it pales by comparison with 9 million premature deaths annually from fossil fuels. And again, that's only from the particulate pollution produced by fossil fuels. It doesn't take into account climate change or any other bad things that fossil fuels do. So nuclear is comparatively safe uh, by most objective measures compared to the other ways we have of making electricity, particularly making it with fossil fuels. There's another connection to nuclear power that <clears throat> is the one that actually troubles me the most, and that's the weapons connection, because most nuclear reactors require that we enrich uranium in that uranium-235, the kind that can undergo fission easily. And once you have enrichment technology, you can easily produce weapons-grade uranium, which is exactly what's happening right now in Iran. And up on the upper right, we see some of the centrifuges that are used to enrich uranium. Um, nuclear reactors also produce plutonium, and it can, with considerable difficulty, it's a technological challenge, but it can be done, it can be separated out to make nuclear weapons. That said, and I worry about nuclear weapons proliferation, to me that's the most dangerous aspect of nuclear power, but the fact is only one country produced its first nuclear weapon from some anything to do with a civilian nuclear program, that was India, and it had a research reactor, not a power reactor, uh, given to it by Canada and supplied with materials by the U.S. Uh, other countries, the USSR formerly and the United Kingdom, have in the past had reactors that were designed both to produce civilian power and plutonium, but these are countries that had already developed nuclear weapons without needing a civilian power program. To do it. So I worry about nuclear weapons proliferation. If a nuclear war happened because of nuclear power, all bets would be off about saying nuclear power is safe, but I think that is highly unlikely given the history of nuclear weapons development. What about some environmental impacts? Well, um, nuclear uh, has a far fewer impacts environmentally. Pardon me, I'm just going to get a timer going here. There we go. Um, and again, this is all related to the nuclear difference. Look at the fuel, a coal burning power plant. These are plants of comparable electrical power output uh, burns 360 tons of coal an hour. A nuclear plant burns 30 tons of uranium a year. You saw that in the picture of the two power plants being refueled. Uh, uh, a coal burning power plant produces 400,000 tons of, of air pollutants per year. Nuclear, it's only about 6,000 tons and they're quite benign compared to what a coal plant produces. Uh, a, Coal plant produces a thousand tons of carbon dioxide an hour, the climate changing greenhouse gas. Nuclear produces none. Doesn't mean nuclear has no climate impact, but it doesn't produce carbon dioxide. Um, <clears throat> solid waste, um, about 30 tons an hour, an hour from a coal burning power plant, roughly 30 tons, a little bit less of high level radioactive waste per year from a nuclear plant. Land use required for a coal plant, and this in both cases, these include the requirements for mining, uh, 17,000 acres uh, versus about 2,000 acres for a nuclear plant. And then what about radiation? Well, the nuclear plant produces more radiation than most coal plants, but coal does contain radioactive materials, uranium and its byproducts. And there are some coals uh, which, if burned in coal burning power plants, actually produce more radiation than do nuclear plants. The comparison isn't really that good, and we have to be careful with it, but even coal produces some radiation. And the biggie that I want to deal with in most of the rest of this talk, though, is cli the climate impact. So this is a graph that appears in my book, Energy, Environment, and Climate, and will appear in the new book with perhaps slight modifications. And what we're looking at here <clears throat> are the amount of CO2 emissions on the left, equivalent CO2 emissions. Sometimes other gases are produced that we make an equivalence to CO2. And they're in grams per kilowatt hour. A kilowatt hour is a unit of electrical energy produced. So this is basically how much CO2 do you make for every unit of electrical energy you produce? And the red bars are the high estimates and the blue bars are the low estimates. In the case of the fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, 
the high estimates are uh, sort of typical old style power plants that we have been burning these things in for years. The blue estimates are some of our highest tech, most efficient power plants that we can produce today. And so you can see there are the, the low estimates are about half the high estimates. In this case, we're quite firm about these estimates because we know how much carbon dioxide is produced by burning fossil fuels. Surprisingly, the next one down on this list in terms of um, production of a CO2 equivalent is solar photovoltaics, my favorite form of energy and the favorite of many environmentalists. Um, why is that so high? It's so high because making solar photovoltaic panels is energy intensive. And if that energy comes from fossil fueled power plants, then there's equivalent CO2 emissions tied up in the manufacture of the solar photovoltaics. On the other hand, if you make the solar photovoltaics with solar electricity or wind electricity or hydroelectricity or even nuclear electricity, then you're way down in this low estimate. And we are quickly transitioning from using coal to make, make photovoltaic panels to using uh, renewables. Hydroelectricity varies dramatically because if you build a hydro dam in the tropics, you trap a lot of organic material in it, which decays and produces methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. And so you get a substantial equivalence. On the other hand, if you build that hydro plant in a northern or temperate climate, that probably doesn't happen much at all. Biomass, down low. Wind, down low, with a couple of estimates, again, depending on how you manufacture the wind turbines. And finally, nuclear. And there's more controversy about nuclear. That red bar could be perhaps twice as high. Uh, and the blue bar could be perhaps very close to zero. Um, most of the um, carbon footprint of nuclear power comes in two things. One in the huge amount of concrete that's required to build a nuclear power plant. Same, by the way, is true for an offshore wind turbine. And making concrete releases carbon dioxide. So that's one reason. Uh, but the other reason is the processing of nuclear fuel, even though we don't need much of it, the enrichment of it is a very energy consumptive process. And so making nuclear fuel requires electricity, and that electricity comes from somewhere. And if it comes from coal burning power plants, it has a significant carbon impact. So all forms of energy have some. Uh, carbon emissions, some greenhouse emissions associated with them, some climate impact, but it's much lower, especially in the low estimates for the non-fossil fuels. And nuclear is right in amongst those uh, as one of them. So uh, nuclear has much less climate impact than many of the other ways we make electricity, but it's not zero. So let's talk about nuclear energy's role in, in making in our energy system for the world today. Um, historically and today, we use it primarily for electricity generation, and we also use it for nautical propulsion. So on the right, you see a nuclear-powered nuclear missile submarine. Um, in the future, we may have nuclear power plants that directly produce hydrogen. And down here, you see a hydrogen filling station. And that's going to be important if we want to get not only the electric power system, but also the transportation system. Uh, off fossil fuels. And another possibility in the future, and also the past, is desalinization. The picture down here shows a desalinization plant that operated uh, in the 19, uh, in the in the late 20th century, 20th century in, Kaz in what's now Kazakhstan. So those are possible future uses of nuclear energy. But I want to emphasize that today, by far, the biggest use of nuclear energy is in electricity generation. <clears throat> and I want to spend the rest of my talk discussing that, particularly in the context of climate change. Nuclear energy's role today is to provide about 10%. There's the 10% level on this graph. There's time from about 1970 when we really began ramping up nuclear power up to today. Today, nuclear power supplies about 10% uh, of the world's electricity. It wasn't always that way. In the 1950s, it was zero because we didn't have nuclear power plants. We began building them in the 50s and 60s and really ramped them up in the 70s. And uh, up we went in, in the share of nuclear power. And it reached not quite 20%, 17% or so uh, in the mid 1990s. And then it began a long, slow decline, <clears throat> which steepened for a while and then has slowed, but it's still a decline. So big number takeaway from this is today, nuclear power supplies about 10% of the world's electricity. It varies from country to country. In the United States, it's 20%. In France, it's 70% or something. Uh, but it varies. But it's worldwide, about 10% of the world's electricity is from nuclear power. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> now, I'm a kind of energy geek, so I love to look in detail about where electricity comes from. And one of my first questions when I teach an environmental class of any kind is to ask my students, where does it go when you flush your toilet? And where does it come from when you plug something into the wall? Where does your electricity come from and where does your waste go? And most students don't have any idea. So let's look at that. So here are some graphs. This is again going to come out in my new version of my book, Energy, Environment, and Climate, and it's gonna look very different than it did in the last edition. So for the world as a whole, don't worry about these minor uh, labels you can't read perhaps, but here are the color codes to those. Uh, the world gets not quite two thirds of its electricity from fossil fuels. Now be careful, I'm only talking here about electricity. Uh, I'm not talking about other energy. We get about 80 something percent of our total energy from fossil fuels. But a lot of that energy goes into transportation and other processes that don't count as making electricity. So about two thirds of our electricity comes from fossil fuels or uh, about 10%, as I said in the previous graph from nuclear, about 16% from hydro and other, which includes biomass and wind and solar and uh, a host of other possibilities. Um, geothermal uh, is about 10%. And that number has come up dramatically just between the two most recent editions of my book. In China, it's pretty similar. Uh, fossil fuels a little bit more, nuclear a bit less, other about the same, hydro about the same. France is very different. France gets 70% of its electricity from nuclear. That's a conscious decision by France to uh, chart a path to energy independence. France doesn't have a lot of fossil fuel resources and it didn't want to be dependent on foreign sources. So it be made a conscious decision to go nuclear and France still gets 70% of its electricity from nuclear, 10% from hydro, 11% from some of these other sources, and only 9% from fossil fuels. So France's greenhouse gas uh, footprint is much less than most other countries. Here's the United States, not much different from the world or China, a little bit less fossil fuel, 62%, <clears throat> more nuclear, almost 20%, hydro's about less than some of the others because we really tapped out our hydro potential and some of the other sources are 12%. So that's what it looks like in the world in 2020 for making electricity. Um, the big takeaway is fossil fuels dominate, nuclear is about 10%, but it doesn't have to be that way. It could be different. Um, let's move on and look at the United States. I'm aware I'm speaking to a global audience, but I wanna just show you some things for the United States because the different states illustrate just how dramatically different things can be. So again, here's electricity in three states I've chosen to look at in the United States in 2020. California, and these are changing very rapidly as I'll show you shortly, is still a, not quite half fossil fuels, mostly natural gas. California gets about 8% of its energy from nuclear. Now, I, I gotta correct that. These graphs are showing you the energy generated in each state. They aren't necessarily the electrical energy consumed in each state because states uh, sell energy across their borders. So California gets some nuclear energy perhaps from outside its borders. It gets some from with it, but, and that isn't counted here, but it generates 8% of the energy generated in Vermont from its uh, nuclear, its only remaining nuclear plant, which is scheduled to shut down in 2024 or 2025. Uh, California gets a substantial amount of energy compared to any other state from geothermal, from its vast geothermal resources. It gets a lot of wind. And look at this, it gets almost a quarter of its energy from solar. And that number is huge and is growing very rapidly, which is a very interesting challenge to the electric power grid. So that's California. Here's Iowa, not exactly a liberal tree-hugging environmentalist state, but it's fossil, uh, energy generation is less than California's. It's only about a third. It doesn't get much nuclear, about 5%. This is from generation within the state. It doesn't get much hydro and it gets almost two thirds of its energy from wind. Uh, and that number has grown dramatically as I'll show you shortly. It gets a tiny bit of solar and a tiny bit from biomass burning. So look at the difference between California and Iowa, just vast difference. And Iowa is, uh, Iowa and Texas are the wind friendly estates in terms of energy generation. Here's New Hampshire. New Hampshire uh, in the Northeast, which is still heavily dependent on nuclear, even as we're shutting down nuclear plants fairly rapidly, uh, gets only 22% from fossil fuels. It does have a fossil fuel, large fossil fuel power plant in state. Again, not gets its energy, but generates 
its energy in state. Uh, but 60% almost is nuclear, a bit of hydro, some wind, only 1% solar, but it's there. And biomass, New Hampshire has a lot of forests and they do have some wood burning power plants. So these are very different states and there are reasons for these differences. Some of the reasons are resources, other reasons are policy. And to the extent that these changes are due to policy, they show you we have some control over the mix of electricity sources that we work with. And let me just focus in on Iowa. Here's that same graph for Iowa from the third edition of my book, which is still the current edition until the new one comes out later this year or next year. Um, and Iowa was getting uh, almost two thirds of its energy from fossil fuels and a substantial 30% from wind, a little bit from nuclear and hydro. We then go to today, the picture I just showed you, and the fossil share has shrunk dramatically, the nuclear and hydro have shrunk a little bit, and wind has grown dramatically to this 57% of Iowa's energy. My own state of Vermont has changed dramatically also. Here's the picture in the second edition of my book, Energy, Environment, and Climate. Um, Vermont had a large, well not a large, a medium-sized nuclear power plant, Vermont Yankee, uh, and it generated most of the electricity made in Vermont 74% of the electricity made in Vermont was nuclear. We were the most nuclear state in the country, uh, comparable to uh, France. We got some of our energy in state from hydro and a little bit from uh, other sources, including biomass and some fossil. Switched to 2020 and Vermont has changed dramatically because in 2014, the Vermont Yankee power plant was shut down. It was shut down after years of protests by environmentalists who wanted it shut down, but that's not why it shut down. It shut down because it couldn't compete economically with cheap natural gas produced in North America by fracking. And so it was shut down. Perfectly functional power plant with a reasonably safe record uh, producing about 600 million watts of power, shut down. And Vermont had to produce power in other ways, uh, and it had to import a lot of power. And again, these graphs are showing you the energy generated within the state, not the energy actually used. So we generate more than half our energy from hydro, uh, biomass and wind and solar all contribute almost equally and solar is growing quite rapidly. Um, I, what these pies don't show you is the total energy, total electricity generated in Vermont dropped dramatically when we shut down that nuclear power plant. And we're now importing a lot more energy than we were. <clears throat> Most of it hydroelectric energy from Quebec uh, but some of it is nuclear energy from New Hampshire and other states in the Northeast. And we, I think we get about 30% of our energy from nuclear, but we don't generate any nuclear in state anymore. So these graphs again show we can make dramatic changes in our energy mix. <clears throat> so now let me get, get to my last questions. Could nuclear solve our climate crisis? And I wanna put a little proviso there. It's not gonna solve the crisis, but could it help solve the crisis? And here I want to quote from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's special report in 2019, we need a sharp decline in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Now it's 2021 today. That would require rapid and far-reaching transitions in energy, land, urban, and infrastructure, including transport and business buildings and industrial systems. Now I've just showed you some graphs that show how rapid and far-reaching transitions in energy are at least possible. Are they likely and could they be spurred by an increase in nuclear power? That's what I want to focus on in the remainder of this talk. <clears throat> so here is a, a graph that I'm going to put again in this new edition of my book showing the historical climate emissions since 1990, historical carbon emissions going up until 2019. Here's the drop of about 6% due to COVID. We've rebounded already in 2021. And if you extrapolate this, we're heading up. These are carbon emissions in billions of tons of carbon per year, not carbon dioxide, but carbon. Um, if we had a 1% annual decrease and switch to that, it would be a dramatic change. And that is in fact what the countries of the world had pledged in their commitments to the Paris Climate Agreement. They aren't living up to those commitments, so we probably aren't going to see even as uh, minimal a decrease as this 1%. We need a 1.8% annual decrease if we are going to uh, have a 50-50 chance of holding global warming to under two degrees. And Joe Biden in April just announced this goal for the United States to bring us down by 2030 to well below where we were in 1990. I show you this graph not to discourage you, but because I wanna emphasize just how dramatic a change is needed in our carbon emissions if we're to solve, if we can call it that, the climate crisis to hold global warming to less than two degrees Celsius in the industrial era uh, 
or better yet, 1.5 degrees Celsius. So could nuclear help solve this crisis? Well, it possibly could because I showed you earlier, it's a low carbon energy source. Also, it's a baseload power. You run big nuclear plants all the time around the clock. And so they produce reliable, steady power the same way fossil fuel plants do. So it's a direct replacement for fossil fuels or could be. <clears throat> but there's a problem here. And that is electricity as shown in this pie graph accounts for only about 25% <clears throat> of our greenhouse gas emissions. Agriculture, which has nothing to do with, or little to do with energy generation, uh, produces another quarter of it. Transportation buildings and industry produce most of the rest. Um, they could be made to use less carbon, produce less carbon, but the electricity sector is only 25%. And remember that nuclear is used primarily to make electricity. It's not used for transportation. Uh, its energy is not used directly in industry. Um, but electrification of some of these other sectors would help. And that's why there's all this talk about electric cars. And some of you may be switching your heating systems to electric heat pumps, which are a clever way of extracting energy from the outside environment using electricity instead of burning a fuel directly. Now, all these electrified vehicles and electrified heating systems, whether they help with the climate problem depends on where the electricity comes from. If it comes from coal burning power plants, you're not achieving much. But it doesn't have to. And part of the push for electrification is not so you can say, I drive a Tesla, so nothing comes out my tailpipe. It's more because we know how to change our electricity mix, as I showed you in some of those earlier graphs, from high carbon sources, fossil fuels, to low carbon sources. And so electrifying cars and heating systems is only half the game. The other half is to make sure we get that electricity from low carbon energy sources. And nuclear could be one of those. But the question I wanna end with is, will nuclear solve our climate crisis? So here's a graph from my new book, Nuclear Choices, the one I'm speaking about here. Um, the world has about 450 operating nuclear reactors and their average age is about 40 years. That's the average lifetime for which they were built. Many of them have had their licenses extended to 60 years and in a few cases, even 80 years. So they will operate some of them beyond that 40 years, but most of them are going to need replacing or shutting down without replacing in the coming years. And here's a graph showing since the 1950s when nuclear power started up to almost 2020, the greens are startups of new nuclear power plants. And you can see they peaked in around the 1980s and it was by the 1990s that nuclear power with all these plants coming online was then producing its greatest share of the world's electricity. But then uh, nuclear plants, startups began to decline. The reasons were many. They were largely economic, but they also followed the Three Mile Island accident. And then in the 19, 1986, the Chernobyl accident. And then in 2010, uh, the Fukushima accident or incident or disaster, however you want to call it. So nuclear startups declined and declined and declined till about 2010. And there's been a very slight uptick in them since then. The Red curves are the shutdowns of nuclear power plants, and they peaked around 1990, uh, but there was a big peak again around 2011 uh, following Fukushima, uh, 2011, 2012, and uh, there had been almost as many shutdowns as startups. So we are barely doing what we would need to do to replace the shutting down of some of these aging reactors. And add into that the fact that it takes 10 to 20 years of lead time to license and produce and test and bring online a new nuclear power plant. And you can see there's an issue here. Uh, if you look at what reactors are under construction today in the world in 2020, there are about 40 under construction in Asia. Most of them are pressurized water reactors, which are descendants of the submarine propulsion reactors developed in the 1950s most common type of reactor used in the world, probably the safest, but not clear. Uh, Eastern Europe and Russia are contributing. We have two reactors under construction in North America, uh, two in South America, and a handful in Western Europe. But most of the action is in Asia and Eastern Europe and Russia. Um, if you look at public support for nuclear power, it's not good. Here's a poll that was taken just after the Fukushima incident or accident or disaster, however you want to call it. And it shows public support for solar is very high, for wind is high, for hydro is high, for gas, okay. For coal, not so good. And nuclear is the worst. 
despite the fact that nuclear is arguably safer and certainly less greenhouse emitting than coal burning power plants. But public support is not strong. Um, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is charged with regulating nuclear issues around the world and also has a role to promote nuclear energy, uh, has projected the share of uh, global electricity that will be produced by nuclear. Today, it's 10 percent. So the low projection and the high projection agree because they're what's actually the case. Uh, by 2030, the IAEA's low projection takes nuclear down to 8 percent. And by 2050, it's down to about 5 or 6%. The high projections only go up to about 12% and then begin to decline. And part of the reason for that is nuclear just is not going to, is going to struggle to keep up with replacing all those reactors. But the other reason for that difference is as we electrify the world, we're going to need more and more and more electricity. And you've seen that nuclear is going to have trouble contributing to that. So we're going to have to build other sources of electricity. Finally, it's difficult for nuclear to compete economically, both with natural gas and with solar and wind. And here is this remarkable graph showing the decline in the cost of solar energy, solar photovoltaic panels in dollars per watt of installed capacity uh, over about the last decade. A remarkable decline, which has made solar uh, in many places the cheapest form of energy. The cost to build a power system with photovoltaics Solar photovoltaics is over a little over a dollar a watt. Natural gas, it's a little under to up to about two dollars. And look at nuclear, it's about six dollars a watt. Nuclear just can't compete economically these days. Um, so I think it's unlikely because of the aging reactors, the shutdowns, the long lead time, the unpopularity and the economic issues that nuclear will solve our climate crisis. Now, I could be wrong. Uh, on June 2nd, The Guardian produced this article saying Bill Gates and Warren Buffett to build a new kind of nuclear reactor in Wyoming. It's a natrium liquid sodium reactor. Here's another type of liquid sodium reactor under consideration. Um, there's a pebble bed reactor in which nuclear fuel is forged into these tiny uh, pebbles with the uranium core. And they, each one is its own containment and waste storage system. And those pebble, those uh, particles are forged into pebbles. This is about a couple inches across. And these are loaded into some kind of bin. And this is a reactor that ostensibly can have all its cooling systems removed and it won't melt down. So these are interesting, innovative new reactor designs. But I remind you, we need a sharp decline in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And something that's still on the drawing boards is unlikely to produce, be producing substantial amounts of electric power by 2030. It doesn't mean it couldn't later in the century, but it's unlikely to meet the, uh, the urgency of the climate crisis. There's the Generation 4 Consortium, a group of countries and uh, scientists who are looking at some specific designs for much more advanced nuclear reactors that would be safer, that might themselves burn, quote, burn up nuclear waste. One of them could produce hydrogen directly to be used as a fuel for transportation. So I could be wrong if some of these come to pass, but these are still on the drawing board. And the IPCC, I remind you, says we need a sharp decline in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. So I'm unlikely to be wrong. For that reason, we aren't going to take things that are on the drawing board or under study and be producing a lot of electricity with them by 2030. Um, small modular reactors are probably a little more promising. These are small reactors that uh, typically owe oh, in the range of 60 to maybe as much as 300 million watts of power, mostly on the smaller side. They're typically going to be buried underground. They might be put into um, into uh, 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 into power plants where there would be maybe 10 or 12 of these things. Uh, New Scale, which is a US company, uh, has uh, had their safety approval in 2020 for their small modular reactor, and they hope to get full approval soon. Uh, and they're smaller and easier to build and quicker to build, so maybe they'll work. And the Russians are big on these, and they have this 70 megawatt uh, floating small modular reactor power plant which uh, has recently been deployed to Murmansk. They can tow it into a city and plug it into the city and supply electric power. So these are a little more promising, but again, they're mostly still on the drawing boards. And I remind you that we need a sharp decline in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Uh, well, let me end with a topic I haven't said much about yet. And that's the other form of nuclear power, the other form of getting energy from nuclear reactions, and that's nuclear fusion. Nuclear fission, which we've already talked about, is what we use now to produce energy in our nuclear power plants. We split heavy nuclei, usually uranium, but also plutonium, 
In fact, plutonium supplies about a third of the energy near the end of the fuel cycle in a nuclear power plant. But there's another nuclear reaction called fusion, which joins light nuclei to release energy. That's the process that powers the sun. So virtually all the energy coming to Earth, 99.98% of it comes from the sun, is from fusion. We don't know how to make fusion in a controlled way on Earth to make electric power. We do know how to make fusion happen in our so-called, quote, hydrogen bombs, which use fusion and fission both to release almost unlimited amounts of destructive energy. We're working on fusion where we would merge a particular isotope of hydrogen called deuterium that has one proton and one neutron, and another isotope of hydrogen called tritium that has two neutrons and a proton, and they join to make helium and a neutron and lots of energy. But we don't know how to make that happen in a power plant. But if we did, there is a huge resource there because one in every 6,500 hydrogen nuclei is deuterium, the fuel we would use. It makes each gallon of seawater the energy equivalent of 350 gallons of gasoline. And if you calculate how long that will last at our current energy consumption rate, it's 25 billion years, uh, about five times as long as the sun is gonna continue to shine. So if we muddle through all the other problems that are facing us, at some point we'll face a problem with the sun going out. In fact, first it will get stronger, but maybe we'll be able to solve that problem with nuclear fusion. Fusion is a huge challenge. You have to heat the fuel up to about 100 million degrees. You've got to contain that hot fuel long enough for fusion to occur, and you've got to figure out how to extract the energy in a practical power plant. On the left is the ITER experimental fusion reactor being built by a huge international consortium in France. It was going to be operational in 2024. Now it's, it's till 2025, and this is just an experiment. It's not going to produce electric power. We had another approach to fusion, bombarding the fuel with laser beams at the National Ignition Facility in California, Livermore, California. Uh, this is the target chamber where 192 laser beams converge on the fusion fuel. Um, but we've actually abandoned the, not completely, but largely abandoned the quest for fusion energy there. And this has gone back to its primary purpose, which is testing nuclear explosives without actually exploding them. So the fusion is a big challenge. And again, I remind you, we need a sharp decline in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And that experimental fusion reactor is only going to be operational for experiments in 2035. So I don't think fusion is going to do it for us, at least for the short term with our climate crisis. Now, I'll end with my own energy vision because people often ask me, well, what do you think will be our energy future? And my answer is uh, indirect solar or direct solar. Direct solar photovoltaic systems that convert uh, sunlight directly into electrical energy. They are all over the place these days because of the uh, the low cost of them. My house is powered by photovoltaics. My computer right now is powered by photovoltaic energy. We make more energy in cloudy Vermont than our house uses. Um, you're looking here at the largest PV power plant in North America. It's not in the United States, it's in Mexico. Here's a Danish wind farm. Wind and hydro are indirect solar because the wind and the water cycle are driven by solar energy. But I acknowledge there might be a place 100 years from now for nuclear fusion. And I wouldn't rule, and here's a nuclear fusion power plant concept, I wouldn't rule out the possibility of advanced fission reactors of the type I've described. But I, I don't think we're going to need those because we're going to get really good at producing energy, particularly by solar photovoltaics and possibly wind. We're going to develop storage systems. We're going to develop long distance energy transmission lines. And I think we will have enough energy just from direct and indirect solar. And that will be a very nice energy future. So I'll stop there and turn it over to questions. Yeah, Rich, thank you so much. I feel like I have a much better grasp about the trade-offs of, of nuclear and environmental um, trade-offs. You mentioned at the beginning of your talk that there are, uh, when you look at different environmentalists, they have a, a variety of opinions on nuclear energy. How would you summarize the biggest disagreements between people who are, are pro versus uh, against nuclear energy? Is it like differing risk profiles or differing interpretations of data or, or something else? Um, I don't think it's different interpretations of data. <clears throat> because the data is pretty solid. Um, I think it is the issue that the risks of nuclear, the risks of a major nuclear accident are significant. Uh, by the way, they're no, <clears throat> no larger than the risks of a major dam break on a hydroelectric dam, uh, but they're big. Chernobyl was a big event. Um, Chernobyl will have killed 
probably tens of thousands of people, maybe less worldwide in the 50 years after the accident. Um, so, you know, people say, well, there's a huge risk here and we can't take the risk of very rare events. On the other hand, we seem to take willingly the risk of 9 million deaths a year from the steady burning of fossil fuels. So I do think it's a different risk profile. I don't think it's about data. Um, and I also think it's about weighing risks in relation to other dangers we face. And the first uh, nuclear environmentalists I quoted, not Greenpeace, but the others are all concerned about the climate problem. And they see nuclear energy as a solution to the climate problem. I don't for the reasons I talked about, but it's not because I'm against nuclear power. It's because I don't think it has time to solve the climate problem. And I think there are better ways to solve it. That makes sense. And how, if at all, do these dynamics change if there is uh in improvements in specifically in the U.S. the electric grid and ability to store electricity, the ability to transmit it across the U.S. Um, do those things have an impact? Yes, <clears throat> because they make the renewables, solar and wind, which have the problem of intermittency, much more viable, and they reduce the impetus, I think, to develop advanced nuclear capabilities um, because we don't need as much of that. I mean, we're always going to need some steady baseload power plants. Um, and they could be, to some extent, uh, nuclear. They could be solar thermal. They could be uh, solar thermal with storage so that they can, they're solar thermal power plants that actually heat a fluid and use it to generate electricity and they can store energy overnight. And so they can run more or less continuously. So there are, are other options. Uh, but if we have good storage and good long-term uh, uh, energy, uh, energy uh, uh, transmission, uh, that's going to make renewables better. And I should add, if we lived in a world, which we don't, where there was plenty of international cooperation, you could imagine a world that was entirely solar powered, always producing solar power on the daytime side of the planet, and with enough cooperation that we ship that power all over the place. That's a real uh, utopian vision, but it's, it's technically certainly possible, and it alleviates the need for uh, lots of energy storage. Right. And thinking about this middle term, uh, are there ways that we can convert uh, fossil fuel plants to nuclear plants or vice versa or to solar plants or are they not swappable? That's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> first of all, there are a number of uh, historical incidents of nuclear plants. I can think of one case in Midland, Michigan where a nuclear power plant was under construction and they decided to switch it to natural gas because a lot of the parts of the nuclear plant, the turbines particularly that generate the electricity and the generators, those shared, they're common. These plants are very similar. A nuclear plant boils water with nuclear fission, and a coal plant boils water with burning coal, and a gas plant burns it, boils water with burning gas. So they are swappable. There was also a uh, rather innovative nuclear plant in Colorado, um, a, a gas-cooled reactor that um, operated for a, a number of years but was not economical, and it was converted to a a, a, a gas plant. Now we can go the other way too, and this is interesting. The Chinese are developing a nuclear power module that can replace the boiler in a coal-fired power plant because China has a big problem with carbon emissions and it's building more coal plants. And it also has a big problem with air pollution. And the first place it's thinking of deploying these nuclear substitutes for fossil boilers is uh, in some of its worst polluted cities. So they would swap out the coal-fired boiler and swap in this nuclear thing. So the answer to your question is you can go both ways because so much of the power of a power plant, the stuff that trans, that, that, the pipes that move hot steam, the turbines that spin with the hot steam and the generators that make the electricity are common to all thermal power plants, power plants that work by heating a fluid and using it to turn a turbine. Right, right. So we have some great audience questions um, that I want to jump to. The first one is from Matthias, who asks, what about the still unresolved problem of nuclear waste storage? What about the large public subsidies which go into funding and running those reactors? Yes, good question. Um, may I um, uh, share, is my screen still shared? Can you still see my screen? Yeah, it looks like it just come up. Okay, so I made a slide because I anticipated that question, <laughs> but I didn't want to make my talk about nuclear waste. Um, yeah. Let me talk about the subsidies first. I agree there are substantial subsidies for nuclear power. Uh, one of the most insidious is a limit on the insurance liability of nuclear power plants. Um, in, the, in the early 2000s, there was a push to develop more nuclear power in the United States. 
Uh, they thought there would be dozens of reactors built. The end result is there are only two. Two more were partly built and canceled at a cost of billions of dollars to South Carolina's uh, electric ratepayers. Um, so there are subsidies. There are also substantial subsidies for fossil fuels. And there are also subsidies for wind and solar. So if you want to talk about subsidies, uh, basically all forms of energy get subsidies and you could argue whether they're fair or whether they're equitable, but it's true everywhere. And I personally think nuclear probably gets more than it needs to, uh, but if it didn't, probably we wouldn't have much of it in the US. That said, the older nuclear plants that were built in the 70s and early 80s are operating uh, and except for the competition with natural gas, they're pretty economical. Um, now let's talk about nuclear waste. Um, my personal belief is that the nuclear waste problem is partly technical, but I think that part has been largely solved. I think it's mostly a political problem. And I'm showing you here just a few things. Here's where nuclear waste comes from. We put uranium in a reactor and it turns into uh, these, I said in, the early, uh, in an early slide, it turns into radioactive stuff, the products that arise when uranium is split. It turns into isotopes of plutonium and other so-called transuranic isotopes that will last for as much as tens of thousands of years. But if you look at the decay of nuclear waste over time, uh, by about a thousand years, the products of nuclear fission, the, the nuclei that are formed in uranium splits, they're back down to the radioactivity of natural uranium ore. The other waste, the transuranic waste, the elements that are heavier even than uranium, that takes a long time, like 100,000 years to get down to the level of natural uranium. But the, but the point is, we think we are understanding how to separate those wastes out and how to use them as fuel in some of these more advanced reactors. Now, I don't think we should be producing uh, mountains of nuclear waste without having solved this problem. But I think part of the problem is that uh, people think, oh, God, it's gonna last millions of years. Well, it is, but not at anywhere near the level of radioactivity it has now. Um, we do not have a good solution in the United States. Uh, here is again these uh, dry cast storages that sit on concrete pads at nuclear power plants. They're good for about 100 years. Here's the tunnel going into Yucca Mountain in Nevada, which as far as uh, I can see is pretty much dead, but maybe it will be revived. But the United States is not the only country working on this. Finland is breaking ground on the world's first nuclear waste repository. and It should be operational in a few years. France is not far behind, and I think Sweden is also doing the same. Um, I personally think, and I uh, rely on some geologist colleagues who have worked on Yucca Mountain, uh, to believe that the, the problem is partly technical, but it's partly political because we didn't solve it before we started producing nuclear waste. And I think that's a problem. But again, we have another waste problem associated with fossil fuel burning because we are allowed to use the atmosphere as an open sewer and we dump 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. And you know that today that's already causing climate problems. So I think nuclear waste is a problem and I think we haven't handled it well. But I think again, you have to ask about the problem in the context of other waste products produced by other forms of energy production. Yeah, that makes sense. Our next question is from TS who asks, is thorium viable as a fuel source for nuclear power plants now, or is it still in the drawing board phase? Uh, that's a good question. <clears throat> thorium is another uh, radioactive element. It, it, it isn't really used as a nuclear fuel, but by bombarding it with neutrons, it can be turned into an isotope of uranium, uranium-233, which doesn't really occur in nature but which can be used in a power plant. So people talk about thorium reactors. These are reactors that actually uh, produce uranium-233 and then fission it on site. Um, people have been building experimental thorium reactors since the start of the nuclear age. Um, I don't know of any thorium reactor today that is uh, economically and technically viable for, for producing energy. I didn't talk about thorium, thorium reactors uh, well, I guess I mentioned molten salt reactors, some of which could be thorium based and use actually a liquid fuel with the thorium incorporated into the fuel. Um, so I, there, there, is no, there are no thorium reactors uh, viably operating today to produce uh, power, at least at any large scale that I know of. Um, I think there is reason to experiment with thorium reactors. I think 
they could contribute to that long-term future in which there are advanced nuclear reactors. And there are countries, particularly India, with abundant thorium resources. The sands on the beaches of India have a lot of thorium in them. And India is working actively on thorium reactors, but we're not there yet. And again, the problem is we have nine years, according to the IPCC, to get the climate emissions under control. So maybe thorium reactors are great, but we don't have time to find out if we're gonna solve the climate problem. Right. And as we look to wrap up here, we have one last question uh, that we have time for. Luke asks, nuclear energy is expensive now, but wasn't decades ago, I believe. How much better a position would we be in now with respect to climate change if there hadn't been an anti-nuclear movement? Um, that's a good question, and I don't really have a good answer. Uh, <clears throat> certainly, the anti-nuclear movement contributed to the need for safety and other regulations that raised the price of nuclear power substantially. But I think it was more the industry itself that brought that on itself because the early power plants, although they were economical, uh, were not as safe as the power plants we're building today. Now they weren't horribly dangerous, but they weren't as safe as what we're building today. And the incident at Three Mile Island that killed no one but had nothing to do with, and had nothing to do with uh, anti-nuclear protesters was one big speed bump and a lot of uh, expensive regulations went in place after that, similarly after Chernobyl, similarly after uh, Fukushima to some extent. So um, I, I suspect a historian of the nuclear age would find some role for the anti-nuclear movement in, um, in raising the price of nuclear power and probably some role also in shutting down viable nuclear plants, particularly in the United States, and therefore requiring more fuel to more energy to produce by fossil fuels. But I don't know what the relative merits of those would be. And I suspect the anti-nuclear movement has played a somewhat smaller role than plain old economics and the industry itself, but I could be wrong. That makes sense. Yeah. So we're just about out of time. Richard, I want to thank you again so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here with us today. Well, it's been great to be here, and uh, I'm just going to show one quick last slide, which shows that we don't have very much, many sources of energy on Earth, and most of it comes from sunlight, which is, again, why I'm pushing for a future in which we get most of our energy from the sun. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Richard's book, Nuclear Choices for the 21st Century, is available now wherever books are sold, including through your local and independent bookseller. For everyone who joined us today, we look forward to seeing you at our next Toxic Google event. Please stay safe and take care.